Uh, talking of the, your interview with Michael Saylor and volatility in markets, I wanted to just call out this uh, conversation that you have with Michael Saylor. Let's take a look at the clip. I think that the number one the number one critique right now of, of Bitcoin is it's volatile, but I don't think it's volatile because it's digital property, or digital energy, or because of all of the constructive uses of it. I think it's volatile because there's too much leverage in the offshore crypto exchanges and the altcoins. I think that I think that what's happening is someone buys an altcoin with a 10x lever, it moves up 20%. They cross collateralize into the second altcoin and then they somehow collateralize that or they tie that into Bitcoin. I think that 20x and 100x leverage in the offshore crypto exchanges has been driving the volatility in Bitcoin. Well, there you have it, Raul. Returning to the point we were making earlier about volatility in Bitcoin as an asset class coming from Michael Saylor uh, and his thesis this is offshore leverage accounting for that volatility in the system. A lot of all assets have leverage. And, you know, it's like it's blamed on hedge funds in the S&P. And it's blamed, you know, there's always somebody to blame it on. And yes, it's because humans love leverage. They cannot help themselves. They just want to have more of something. And so, yes, Asian leverage at like 10x or 20x leverage causes price spikes. And it's just a feature of the market. Now, we've seen leverage coming down, you know, the 100x products are all kind of starting to reduce down to 10x. What's beautiful about leverage in the crypto market versus the futures market is if you go in the futures market and you get leverage, you get a margin call. And if the, if the market's then down again the next day, you know, your margin still goes up and you've got to deliver that margin and there's settlement time and you can get yourself in a world of pain. Uh, you know, if you're trading agricultural commodities, they can go to limit down for a week and you're trying to pay margin all the time and you can bankrupt yourself easily. Crypto is beautiful because it's fully collateralized. So the moment it hits the, the, the margin limit, it's liquidated. That's why it's volatile. That volatility is a key feature that makes crypto as a market so robust. Yeah. Because you can't have a situation where somebody can't meet their margin call because there are no margin calls because it's instant liquidation. So you're trading off the big risk for the smaller risks. Yes, and you know, leverage can build up in a bull market so the, the, the risk can be bigger, but over time, you, you, you don't have the institution going under side of the issue or you know, big investment house going under. It's, it's not a feature of the space within retail. Obviously, we'll screw that all up because the hedge funds will take too much leverage and somebody else will, you know, that's humans. We just always abuse leverage. Yeah, I mean, I just had my global macro investor roundtable. And um, normally we would have spent a long time talking about currency markets, stuff like that. We kind of flicked over all of that. Everybody is more interested in the in the crypto side of things, which I've been talking about for a while. Crypto and macro have merged. That's what Sky, Skybridge is telling you. That's what global macro investor tells us it's merged and it's not from speculative activity like you know the price is going up so we're all interested i mean everybody's building businesses um so you know it's fascinating it's it's a really really big movement talking about things like tokenization trading of traditional assets on digital rails on distributed ledger technology rails this is something that there's just so much enthusiasm on and it was surreal to see these uh you know the older guys in the blue suits talking to crypto kids in t-shirts i mean it really did have this worlds collide feel about it yeah and you know and this has been my thesis for some time and i pointed it out back in March 2020, it's like these worlds have cl collided, you're just about to find out about it. And now everybody can see. And you know, my guess is, my guess is the ETF comes off in the next month or two, that'll be another wave of adoption. And before you know it, it's a fully financialized product, i.e. it's part of the offering of, of all of the investment banks, the asset management firms, everybody, that's all to come. Yeah. So, Raul, uh, we're getting absolutely bombarded with questions. Should we dive in and answer a few? Let's do it. Um, so this is uh, an interesting question. Oh, boy. Do we start with this one? Here's a here's a time bomb for you, Raul. It comes from Ulf J. And the question is, uh, why do Bitcoin only people not see the network effects on other cryptos? <laughs> well, I've talked about this at length is there's a whole group who are very smart that say, listen, I'm actually just interested in the monetary aspects of Bitcoin, and that's what I want to focus on. 
absolutely fine. There's a bunch that say, listen, I've looked at this and I think that Bitcoin is going to end up being entirely dominant um, because of this monetary aspect and the security of the network. And that's fine, but they have to see that there is a probability that something else could. Um, and then there's a bunch of people who just don't want to hear. And that those are the people who tend to be driven to protect tribally their network. Because if it's network adoption, then they need to protect their network at all costs. Well, kind of Ethereans and others tend to be more aware of the broader network itself of all of this being part of a larger network and that the rising tide lifts all boats. And my point of view has always been, I think the market cap goes from 2 trillion to 200 trillion in the next 10 years. And mm. there's plenty of room for everybody. Nobody's eating anybody's pie here. All the pies are going to grow. So, you know, as Solana grows, it's only helping the Ethereum ecosystem grow and it's only going to help Bitcoin grow because more people come into the space. The pie is growing. It's all going up in value over time. Here's a great question that comes to us from uh, Real Visions Exchange. It's from Jonah I. Rao. And the question is, is there a risk that the crypto sector would be the hardest hit from Fed tightening given how much extra liquidity has been going into the space? Boy, a perfect question merging the worlds of cryptocurrency and macro. Um, I don't think we're at that point in the tightening cycle where it, where it happens. When capital comes out of the system, you will see crypto markets trade off, and that's typical of the business cycle. But we're nowhere near that yet. We're, we're at tapering point. So when are they actually going to raise rates, if ever? But let's say they get the... Are they ever going to shrink the balance sheet again? It's a tough call, but if they did, Let's say summer 2022, if you listen to what the Fed say. Well, that's when you start worrying about it. And generally, markets don't fall from rising rates until maybe a year after that, too. So I don't think that's going to be the primary driver of the crypto cycle, but it's probably going to ha have an influence. Yeah. Uh, here's a question that comes to us uh, from John Lloyd, also on the exchange. And the question is, uh, is this ban in China materially different from all the other times that China has banned crypto? <laughs> uh, I don't think so. Their motivation is different here. I think a lot of the time it is about currency leakages and, you know, the use of crypto within the economy. Um, and I think it's it's based on a similar thing. But I think because of the central bank digital currency coming, it's more pressing right now. So, so Raul, as you look forward, thinking about what we've seen here today uh, and over the last uh, week from Gary Gensler, from China, what are you going to be looking at yourself uh, to make determinations about what's happening in these markets? How are you thinking about it and what are the dials you're going to be watching? In, in terms of crypto? Yeah. For me, I... Nothing is going to change versus the macro backdrop of network adoption. So we're at the point in the cycle where network adoption is very strong. I don't see a change in that. So really, it's where are we and when does this correction finish, which I think finishes in the next two or three days, if my work is right. And then if I'm right, we should start to see accelerated moves. So that's what I'm looking for a something to confirm my thesis. Um, and my th thesis is based that October, November, December are ridiculous. Um, so I use a lot of charts for that. Start to look at, you know, how some of the, the other protocols and tokens are performing versus Ethereum and Bitcoin, because we should see a further out on the risk curve still. So we should see, you know, over time that, um, that Ether Bitcoin cross, I think, that's uh, got almost up to the 0 0.08. It came down again. Where is it now? Um, 0 0.07. I think once it goes through 0 0.08, that'll be the that'll be the signal for the next phase in this whole crypto market, which is usually the rewarding phase. But it's just a thesis, and it could change. So I don't know. But you know, I'm not changing or doing anything. You know, I added I added the dip last week earlier earlier this week. And I have no cash left to put in the market, so that's it. <laughs> what else are you seeing 
uh, in markets right now. Uh, possibly how does crypto tie in with the broader macro picture uh, and what else are you thinking about? I mean, the, the only real feature of this market has been the slight rise in bond yields after the Fed. Um, and I think they're at the top of the range now. They got to the bottom of the range. They tried several times to break lower. The dollar has tried several times to break higher and failed. The market is still trying to figure out this inflation deflation thing. I did a great interview with David Rosenberg today about this. Um, he's firmly in my camp that any move higher in bond yields is a red herring um, because of the fiscal cliff that's coming, uh, plus the amount of demand that got pulled forward last year, um, plus maybe what's happening in the employment market, plus what's happening in China, plus the rising prices on gasoline, cars, other stuff that we're seeing is stalling demand. So I'm looking at that still. So that's the big focus. Problem is, is you know, I come on this once a month, once every three weeks, and I'd say the same thing because macro gets one data point a month. Right. The rest is market noise. And the markets have also said, we don't really know what's going on. So let's see. So everything's been in a very sideways range for a while. And macro, as I've always said, it is like waiting for a bus. <laughs> you, you sit around, no buses come along, then they all come at once. So, and I mentioned that the last time before. So that's the buses. I think the crypto bus is about to be the rocket ship that I mentioned last time. 